Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God, our wisdom, our salvation. Amen. You ever sit around a campfire at night and tell stories? Or maybe the fire pit in the backyard? Family get together and you talk, you talk about this or that or the other, but at some point maybe you tell a story. Somebody's reminded of something that happened years ago, and so you tell a story. When our kids were young, we would like to tell them stories about relatives that they never knew, because we thought it was important for them to know some of those stories, and now I've, we've got the great privilege of telling some of those stories to our grandchildren. And so we tell stories. And boy, I'll tell you what, while we all tell stories, there's some people, they really know how to tell a story, right? There are certain people that are really good storytellers. When I was a very young pastor, a couple blocks down from the church, there was a Catholic church, and the senior priest was a really good storyteller. In fact, he was one of those persons who had a story for just about everything. And so whenever we would have our ministerial association meetings once a month and we'd get together at a different church each month and we'd have lunch, before we sat down at the business meeting, you know, to, to discuss the business of the association, I always wanted to have lunch and sit close enough to him because I knew at some point in the midst of the conversation he'd have a story. And it would be good. Stories give us our identity. Stories reveal something about who we are or who we do not want to be. Stories help locate our lives in the life of others. I want you to kind of think about these stories of Jacob that we've been looking at the past three weeks or so, three or four weeks, as stories that also would have been told around the campfire as stories that would have been told for all the same reasons we tell stories. Maybe they're funny, there's humor in them, maybe they're perplexing in some way, maybe there's a moral to the story, maybe not. But the ancient Israelites would have told these stories and they would have reasons why they told these stories. We saw a couple of weeks ago when Jacob and Esau were born and, and Esau is born first, and he's grabbing, he's grabbing his brother's heel. Remember, the, Jacob's name means grabber. We can't forget that because that, that's important, grabber. And then he manages to connive Esau out of his birthright and out of his blessing from his father. Perhaps one of the reasons that the story of Jacob and Esau were told by the ancient Israelites is because the descent, there, was, there would come a time when the descendants of Esau, the nation of Edom, would be quite troublesome to the Israelites. Perhaps the, the relationship was very strained and not even strained at times, maybe hostile. And so by telling the story of Jacob and Esau, Jacob, whose name we will find out, Soon, not this week. His name is changed to Israel. Maybe it was a way for the Israelites to say, in the midst of those frustrations they were having with their neighbors, saying, well, at least at the beginning we got them. There's a reason why we're the ones who God is working with, working through. And then, of course... We want to hear stories because, well, they give us a sense of satisfaction. Don't you just love it in the movie or in the novel or whatever it is when the bad guy gets what's coming to him? Every single one of us likes that. What goes around comes around, we say. And that's true not just in novels and 
in fiction. It's true in real life. There's all kinds of historical examples of what goes around comes around. See this story this morning between Jacob and Laban as a, what goes around comes around moment for Jacob. He spent his life grabbing after everything he's wanted. He connives. He's dishonest. And he takes advantage of others. And so now Jacob meets who's going to be his future father-in-law, Laban, and what Jacob will soon come to realize that when it comes to conniving and deceiving and lying, Jacob has met his match. And his father-in-law, no less. And we need to hear what this story is about. Sometimes what happens is we get lost in the story that, that uh, uh, Jacob works for Rachel for seven years and then he finds out after seven years on the day after the wedding it's not Rachel, it's Leah. That raises all kinds of questions. We won't even go there. But then he's willing to work another seven years for Rachel, whom he loves. And we say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Jacob's love for Rachel, isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? Well, I suppose it is. But the fact of the matter is this story is not appropriate for a Hallmark movie. This is not the point. Laban has two daughters. The older is Leah. The younger is Rachel. We're told Leah has, our translation says, delicate eyes. Some of the other translations will say beautiful eyes. But Rachel, we're told, has a beautiful figure and is good looking. To say Leah has delicate eyes is to say Rachel is prettier. And Jacob loves Rachel. And so Laban makes a deal. By the way, have you noticed in the story that Leah, neither Leah and Rachel are consulted about this. It's kind of the way that works in, in the ancient culture. It's just the way it is. I'm glad it's not true in our context today, although there are some places in the world. And so says, well, you know what? Laban says, I'd rather you be married to my daughter, so I'll tell you what, you work for me for seven years, And then you can marry Rachel. And so Jacob, who loves Rachel, is willing to work for Laban. After all, he does have to work, right? And so you get to the end of the seven years, and they have a big banquet and a big wedding. And man, what the day is. And here is Jacob. He's just so happy that, that he's finally getting to marry his love. And he finds out that, well, Laban... As deceived. He's actually working his way to grab another seven years of labor <laughs> from Jacob. And so when Jacob complains, he says, whoa, 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 whoa. He says, in our, in our culture, I don't know if this, maybe it's not true, your culture, he says, in our culture, we don't give the younger daughter away first. Wasn't it Jacob who connived everything away from Esau that was by right his because he was older? <laughs> and now what goes around comes around. There's nothing he can do to connive his way out of this one. And so Laban says, I'll tell you what. You can marry Rachel to half eh, for another seven years. Now, he doesn't have to wait another seven years. He gives Rachel's hand in marriage to Jacob a week after the honeymoon, if you will, a week after the week honeymoon is over. But he does have to stay there and work for another seven years when he really, really wants to 
go home. Now, this is just an interesting story. One of the things when we read the Bible at times is, well, let me say it this way. When I read the Bible at times, <laughs> I read certain stories and I say to myself, what do I do with this? You know, we do tend to read the Bible as like an instruction book. We go there so that we can know how to live and live faithfully. And that's, that's good because there's a lot in the Bible that gives us good instruction on how to live faithfully and also what not to do. But it just doesn't seem that everything in the Bible falls into that, right? It's just, I read this story, it's got some humor, it's entertaining, it raises interesting questions, but I look at it and say, okay, now what do I do with this? What do I say to you this day that I think we should do something with this? I mean, I suppose I could say, don't be like Laban. Or I suppose I could say, if you're like Jacob, it'll come back to you eventually. Isn't it? The Bible says, beware your sins, will find you out. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's true. Just seems to me, though, that's not the reason the story is being told. And I'm just not sure that, that every story in the Bible has a moral for us. And so if it doesn't have a moral for us, why, are, why is it being told? Why is this in Scripture? Why, why is it here? I think one of the things we always have to remember as we read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, that first and foremost, centrally, specifically, the Bible is not the story of us. The Bible is the story of God. The Bible is the story of God and his love for us and his working in this world in all the complex ways of humanity, in the midst of the complexity of who we all are as human beings, all those, those things about you and I, you, the, the, all of us, things about me that are strong and good and true and faithful and all so the ways I fall short <laughs> and the ways that I don't measure up. And so I suppose... What we read here first and foremost are the story of God, the story of God, who God is going to continue to work. He's going to continue to work through his own people when they're faithful and when they're not, when they're honest and when they're true and when they're dishonest and they're conniving. And none of that justifies the conniving and the dishonesty. We can't walk away from these stories saying, well, since Jacob was one of the patriarchs, I suppose it's okay to be conniving and dishonest. No. But rather, what I think this story gives to us is a reminder that in the midst of just at times the ambiguity of life, the ambiguity of things and the not knowing, we are in a time of ambiguity and not knowing, aren't we? In the midst of that, these stories say to us that this God, the God of Jacob, is still working and is still moving, no matter what. Where is God in the midst of Jacob conniving and Laban's dishonesty in the midst of, well, he's not approving of it, but God is working in it. He's using it somehow. And you know, maybe, just maybe, let me back up a little bit. Let me not, let me say, well, maybe there is a moral here, although it's not completely obvious. Maybe there is. Jesus in the Gospels today tells parables about the kingdom. And one of the parables he says is that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and 
planted in a field, and it's the smallest of all seeds. Well, it's not really the smallest. There are smaller ones, but mustard seeds are pretty small. But when it's grown, it's the largest of all vegetable plants. It almost becomes a tree, a very large bush, so that the birds in the sky come and nest in its branches. One of the things that's always amazed me and I've never tired of, in fact, Carol and I were having this conversation yesterday because our garden now is coming in, right? And I've been a vegetable gardener for many years, is how you take that little seed and everything that that seed needs to become a plant and bear fruit is in that little seed. All the genetic material, the DNA, and all the other stuff that's in that seed, that's all that seed needs. And with a little nurture, with some good soil and some water, that little seed grows. It's amazing, isn't it? And so I wonder, I wonder if maybe what we read in these stories too is that we read about Jacob and Isaac before him and Abraham before him and we're going to read and Hagar and Sarah and, and we're going to read later, you know, if you keep going in the Old Testament and you get David and Solomon, you get all these folks and in the New Testament too, is that I think maybe one of the things we get out of this is that in spite of all their foibles, in spite of all their shortcomings, at times they exercise a mustard seed of faith in God. Just a mustard seed. And yet Jesus says God can do something with that. <laughs> God can do something with that tiny faith. And so maybe... The moral of the story here is don't be like Jacob, don't be like Laban, except every now and then, in the midst of the complexity of their lives, they get it right. They're faithful. And I personally find comfort in that. Because there are times I get it wrong. But I'm thankful that the same God who could use Jacob with him and in spite of him can use me. If there's a moral, maybe the moral is when I'm not faithful, God is. Because after all, what we are reading and reflecting upon is the story of God. That story is still being written. It's being told in this place and outside of this place. And this week, the story of God is being told and proclaimed in our lives. We are the storytellers. Even when we, when we tell the story well, by our faithfulness and when we don't tell it as faithfully as we should the story is still being told that mustard seed of faith has everything in it to grow and to be nurtured and that mustard seed of faith is within each and every one of us So what's the moral of the story? God is with us. God is working. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, how grateful we are of your presence with us and with your people. Oh, yes, we get it wrong. We know we get it wrong. But we also get it right. And we know that there is always grace to sustain us. 
Help us to remember, gracious God, that as we give our attention, and we should give our attention to all the thou shalt nots and thou shalt in Scripture, important, but help us never to lose sight of the fact that in the midst of all the shalt, thou shalt nots and thou shalt, you are with us and working. And how grateful we are that this wonderful story of God that has come to us in the pages of Scripture, this wonderful story of you and your work has come to us in these words. How grateful we are that your story is still being told through us. Those of us who at times have the faith of a mighty oak tree and at other times the faith of a mustard seed. Help us to remember that the best of all this day is that you are with us. Amen. Friends, at this time we're going to have